Good evening and welcome to uh, this uh, panel discussion which will explore the key issues raised by the film. I'm uh, Christine Lutranger from the Institute's Albert Hitchman Center on Democracy and I will moderate this debate. So for those of you who will be able to stay on, uh, we'll have a 45 minutes discussion and you'll be able to ask your questions to our three panelists. So I'm glad to welcome here uh, Jamil Chade, who is a Brazilian uh, reporter in uh, Europe for news groups uh, UOL. He's also a columnist at Radio Bandeirantes and a daily columnist at Band News TV. His blog has an audience of over two million um, people per month. Um, he was also elected twice, uh, 2011 and 2013, as the best uh, Brazilian foreign co correspondent. And in 2015, he was chosen as one of the 40th uh, most influential journalists in Brazil. Jamil uh, was one of the researchers of the National Truth Commission, which was created by the government of Brazil to investigate crimes and violations of uh, human rights committed during the military regime in the country. And he's also a part of an international network of specialists dealing with corruption, uh, the Transparency International's anti-corruption solutions and knowledge. And then I'm pleased to welcome Janina Welp, who is a research associate at the Albert Hichmann Center on Democracy. She joined us uh, this month. Uh, previously, she was 10 years in Zurich, um, where she was the principal researcher at the Center for Democracy Studies and the co-director of the Zurich Latin American Center. Her research interests include comparative studies on participatory democracy in Latin America, uh, preconditions and uses of direct democracy mechanisms, processes of democratization, and the role of ICTs to promote democracy and governance. And uh, Paolo de Tarso Lugan Arantes uh, is an international jurist and researcher with extensive experience in international law, human rights, and uh, international fundamental rights protection systems. He studied in several universities in Brazil, Europe, and uh, he got his PhD from Leuven University's, uh, University with the thesis on racial discrimination. Uh, currently, Paolo, um, or he has been actually representing um, a, a coalition of Latin American NGOs in Geneva and he's a consultant for civil society organizations at the United Nations and European institutions. So welcome to all of you and thank you for uh, your time. Um, I would first turn to, to Jamil. Since you have been the first one to publish an interview with uh, Petra Costa, the uh, filmmaker after the release of The Edge of Democracy, uh, what was her objective and what did she tell you about what she discovered while making the movie. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, this is the third time I see this uh, movie and it's the third time I cry. Um, so it's not, um, it's not easy. Uh, it's dramatic, actually, what we live. Um, and uh, while we were um, sitting there, I decided to text Petra instead of speaking myself. Uh, and she wrote something quite nice to all of us. Uh, and I'm going to read it, it's very short. Uh, Dear people of Geneva, I wanted to thank you deeply for coming to see our movie. If you are Brazilian, I imagine that you, like me, are suffering from the direction our country has taken. If you're not Brazilian, you might be worried for our own country. This movie was made with the desire to understand this trauma. I and so many I know went through in seeing things we thought were guaranteed collapsing before our eyes. And the first step of healing a trauma is to tell. Telling to make sure we didn't go crazy. That we actually went through what we went through. That 30 million people left poverty. That we had a democracy that worked amidst trial and errors. Because what guarantees that a democracy work is a level of mutual respect 
where one party recognizes the victory of the other, that our political opponents are not treated as criminals, but as legitimate opponents, that eroded in Brazil, and with, with it, people's belief in democracy eroded too. We must now work to rescue this democracy, and it depends on each of us. We need to fight for everyone to have the right to a fair trial, including Lula, who is now in more than uh, 550 days in jail, that people stop being killed from helicopters in the favelas, that indigenous reserves be respected, that our forests stop being turned, uh, burned. May the human rights we fought so hard to conquer be preserved. You are here in Geneva, so close to the UN. Please protest. Make the teenagers inspire you to take a day of, a, of the week and protest continuously. It is urgent. Thank you. So this is what basically she wrote while we we're here. But there's one element to this uh, movie which is absolutely, uh, besides the debate, the political debate that it generated in Brazil was, was huge. Uh, but besides that, she brings uh, people to the epicenter of the earthquake. Uh, her images, what she brings in these two hours, are absolutely part of our recent history. And this is, besides the political story of this movie, there's the artistic part of it, which is absolutely um, incredible. So this is the first uh, sense. A answering to your question, I, I ask, well, why did she go, why did she uh, embark on this trip? And there's a scene that perhaps you will remember, um, it's at, by the beach, it's in Rio, and uh, there's a demonstration, and the police, well, there's a, there's a clash between, um, let's say, the right wing and two students that were using red shirts. Um, that is in the, basically in the middle of the movie. Uh, that was the first scene she filmed. She was in her apartment, and she, decided, she saw the demonstration, and as a journalist um, or a filmmaker, uh, she did what she had to do. She got a camera and went downstairs and went into the, the crowd. And she tells that when she, when she understood what was happening, she thought that, yes, we have a sick society. Uh, and that's the, the starting point of this entire movie. So it's very interesting that the starting point of this movie is actually in the middle. Uh, she obviously, she built the movie in a very different way after that. Um, so that is the, the starting point. And just a last thing, um, which I've also found very interesting what she said, was the fact that uh, she wanted to tell the pain we were living in. And not the pain of the losers or the winners, or, no, the pain of basically seeing democracy being eroded. So this pain was not of the winners or the losers, but was of society as a whole. That was what she said. And finally, um, that's something that she repeats over and over. If she knew what Bolsonaro's government would have uh, done, basically in six months, she would not have um, put out the movie. She would have waited and done something even stronger, according to her. So we can only hope there will be season two. Thank you, uh, Jamal. So, in fact, this, this also um, brings us to the key question of today's politics and also reflecting on how uh, the media and social media have shaped um, the campaign and, and Bolsonaro's election. Could you say something about it, uh, Janina? Yeah, first of all, let me say that um, I find the documentary impressive. I think it's really, really interesting and it's a lot to discuss about it and the approach. And so my congratulations to Petra. Um, about the question, I think after Bolsonaro's electoral triumph, there was a kind of very simplistic argument going around. And this argument was could be summarized such as saying something like, there is an enemy, an evil, this is the Workers' Party, Dilma, Lula, and there is a hero, hero, using Bolsonaro's terms, and this was spread, disseminated through the media, and just worked. 
in a, such an automatic way. And again, thinking in Petra's message, I think if we have to focus now on how to restore democracy, how to build this again, and also thinking in the European context, we should avoid such a simplistic arguments and affirmations. Looking at the communication theories, for, for a long time we know that messages work in context, are influenced by a context. And in the case of Brazil, it's much more complex than that. And I think we have to understand really this context to act and to think in the future. And just to finish with the idea, let me put on the table a study Gisela Sarenberg from Flaxo Mexico did using data from the protest in 2015, in April. There is a data from Latino Barometer, a survey analyzing the profile of pro-impeachment protesters and pro-Dilma protesters. And she found that the profile in terms of gender or socioeconomic status, education, etc., was not so different. There are some differences, but are not so remarkable as you can expect. But the main difference was in terms of social capital or socialization. The pro-Dilma group was much more engaged in political parties, club, sport clubs, community uh, activities, activities, etc., while the pro-impeachment were much more isolated. And I think this is quite key to understand why this message is, is so effective in some groups, which are, you can imagine, I mean, exaggerating a profile of a person who is just watching TV and eating at home without talking about politics, without really acquiring a political capital. And suddenly, all this message of hate can really be effective. And I think it's an interesting point to think in the future. The, the film is also brings very, very strong messages as far as institutions are concerned and the rule of law is concerned. Uh, Paolo, as, as a lawyer, um, how do you, could you comment on, on the situation today of, of Brazil in, in a global context whereby Brazil has, since decades, since the 1990s, uh, uh, established itself as uh, uh, on the, on the, on the globally as a promoter of human rights, uh, uh, signing treaties. So what, what, what is the, 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 the situation today and, and uh, what can we expect from the new administration in terms of the respect or the promotion or the, or the, or the discourse around uh, human rights? Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, thank you so much for being here. Uh, to address your question, I will pick a thread since the early 90s when uh, after the five years of redemocratization started and then Brazil started ratifying the first human rights treaties in the right-wing administration of Collor de Mello. So it, it was, you know, through our diplomatic service, but you know, I think it was really the will of Brazil to forget the atrocities of the past to open to the international society. And then if we go a few years later, we have the Cardoso administration posing a permanent invitation to all the special procedures here in Geneva. So we have 20 years of this experience. So uh, officially, or at least, uh, uh, let's say rhetorically, any international expert is, is able, you know, allowed to visit Brazil. And then during the Lula administration, I think this international exposure uh, is, was strengthened. We saw a very strong movement on, on many issues. I mean, we could also mention the courage of Dilma Rousseff in uh, proposing the so-called responsibility while protecting, which is a counterpart of the very famous responsibility to protect. So if, if, you, if you, in a last case you, you, you invade a country, you occupy a country, you, you have a responsibility of so many, so many other things. So, 
and then the previous administrations, they were courageous enough to attend both the World Economic Forum in Davos and the World Social <coughs> Forum in, in Porto Alegre, in Africa, or any other uh, developing country. I think uh, a, a, a nice turning point of the movie was the was the, the, the protest of 2013. We haven't digested that yet, at least myself, I haven't. But we see a sort of a, a freezing or a slowing down of a Brazil's foreign policy. So it was kept very much in the, let's say, in the, in the automatic. But what we have seen now from the Bolsonaro administration is completely uh, unprecedented even compared to the military regime because in the last in the uh, in the in the late 70s uh, the military started to to work independently and not to apply an automatic alignment to the, the to to the US so we see in a few months an automatic and unconditional alignment to, to the Trump administration, and not only institutional to the US or idea. Uh, his foreign policy is very personal, you know, uh, the colleague was telling about uh, media and so on, but I don't think Bolsonaro's tweet diplomacy is very successful. And we have some examples uh, of his foreign policy that we don't understand, not, it in, not, not even for the business community. Uh, for example, Bolsonaro praising uh, Pinochet for having killing the father of Madame Bachelet, because by doing that, uh, Pinochet avoided that Chile would be, uh, would have been transported in Cuba. Or, uh, oh, I mean, I won't say all of those actions, but the Brazilian foreign policy on climate and this goes counter a tradition, you know, uh, I, I've quoted president from several parties of Brazil as an honest broker between developed and developing countries. Brazil's self-interest in playing a, 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 I would say, a hard, soft power because Brazil is a continental country. Uh, we're not a nuclear power, so one of our strengths of defense is really, you know, persuasion, dialogue. So the question of how international is the Amazon, we haven't talked about this for decades, and now Bolsonaro really reopened the debate, and we don't know now, we don't know why. I mean, even the business community is, is very unhappy about it. And you see, like, the soy king say, hey, president, hey, stop, you know? We need at least to say that we are preserving the Amazon, although the real interests are not very, very clear. So I'm sorry, I mean, for the time being, there is not such a crystal ball, you know, to see what will happen in Brazilian human rights foreign policy. But some forecasts are really, are really uh, difficult because nothing is disconnected from the the national content, for example, by Brazil dismantling the national protection, the national prevention mechanism on torture, Brazil's, uh, the government shrinking civil society space. So a country which in 2002 was leading, we're talking about 20 years ago, leading the gender initiatives in Geneva in the third committee, doing what it does now. So I just take the thread and for further reflection. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, uh, multi-layered turning point, actually, politically, ecologically, socially, uh, culturally. So, I would like to open the, the floor for uh, your questions. So, if you could raise your hands, introduce yourself briefly, say your name, uh, where you are from, and keep your questions concise for the sake of time. Thank you. So, yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Cooper. Uh, I'm a student here in Geneva, and I just wanted to ask you guys about um, the intercepts recent uh, well, intercept of Judge Morrow's text messages with the prosecutors and how he organized uh, the trial and how that influences now, given seeing the film, uh, how that would influence your perspective on on things. Shall we take another two questions? Yes. Uh, 
Uh, bonsoir. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Jason. I'm a political science and international relations student here at the Institute. Uh, and in reference to the Land Barometer uh, report uh, regarding the pro-impeachment camp and them being perceived as more socially excluded, to what extent do you think Lula and Rousseff uh, governments, in spite of their extended social programs, um, bear responsibility for the social exclusion? Um, and do you think that if their uh, governance regarding the, um, the Brazilian economy uh, and the lack of diversification of the economy could have helped them to divert perhaps or to not go down that, that road uh, if, if the economy was more diversified, uh, thus not leading uh, the economy down south uh, because of basically oil prices going south. I, I mean, this is very simplistic, but still, yeah. Thank you. And then, yes, here. Thank you. Uh, good evening, my name is Fernanda, I'm Brazilian. Um, and considering that Petra's intent with this documentary is to make people save Brazilian democracy, my question for you and as a lawyer, law student is, how can we say, we Brazilians, save our democracy now uh, from the institutional way, if we don't trust our institutions anymore? Uh, and by this, I would like to mention again this recent scandals and all many others shown in the documentary. So would we have to wait for another election for the next three years now? Is, isn't it too late for us? So, Jamil, would you like to address some of the questions? Intercept all the easy questions, right? Uh, you, can, you can pick and choose. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the Intercept uh, stories are absolutely fundamental. Uh, uh, they show, uh, first, let's, let's put it in order. First, they show that we journalists didn't do our job. That's first, okay? Didn't do, not now, for the last five years. Uh, we didn't question enough. We didn't, we took it for granted. We thought, and it was, in a way, you can say, yes, there was a complot, etc. Maybe, uh, but most of the time it was just, at that point, trust in what uh, was coming out from uh, the prosecutor's office. Uh, we didn't put questions, we didn't go further enough to say, wait, wait, are you sure what you're saying? Uh, and not in the Lula's case, there were 250 other cases. So we didn't put enough questions. I'm not saying uh, corruption did not exist, that's not the point, huh? that's not the point. So what the Intercept is doing by revealing all of this is basically showing that there was an entire, uh, I wouldn't say different story, but there was more layers to that story than what we were reporting. So that is the first element, that, and, and that's why it is important uh, what is being published. Um, it goes to, to, to also to your question on, um, on the political aspect of all of this. Uh, her last uh, line, which is just written because actually she didn't put the image because we didn't have time, when she says that Moro uh, became uh, the Minister of Justice of the government that won the election of the candidate that he put in prison. Uh, I mean, she didn't put it like this, but that's what it is. Uh, and now you can say, wait, wait, but that, that, you're, 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 taking conclu you're, you're getting to conclusions. I'm not getting to the conclusion. I'm, I'm just telling the story. No, the story is that in six months, uh, the, the judge put someone in prison, that person could not run, uh, the other person won the election, and the judge became the minister, right? I mean, it, it, that, that's the story that we can also tell in, in this case. So was there a political element to it? Uh, there was certainly a personal element. There, certainly there was a, a personal element to this story, personal in, in terms of ambition. Uh, so th there is th this story as well. So why the, the Intercept uh, stories are important? Uh, to reveal, first, that maybe we shouldn't have trusted. Now we don't trust, obviously. But uh, what to do next? I mean, it is not to uh, commit the same, same mistakes and basically ignore again law. Uh, I think it's exactly the contrary uh, by, first of all, now... The, the, the challenge will be very, very huge. 
First, to, uh, in a way, unify every social movement possible uh, of human rights of every single sector of the society. Uh, that is the, the only way, basically, that this fabric will be recreated. Otherwise, we're going to fall into the same trap. Uh, I'm gonna, because they um, ignored uh, 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 the law, we can do that as well. No, we cannot. Uh, now, it is going to be difficult. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we, uh, personally, in the press, uh, uh, I mean, as a journalist, we see an attack that is absolutely uh, explicit in, into our work. And it's daily. It's not sometimes uh, you suffer an attack. Uh, it's absolutely the, the amount of friends I have that have been harassed, not by the digital militias, not by the uh, boots or by the robots, by the president himself. Right? It's not... Uh, uh, can I tell a very short story? There's a colleague of mine in Rio. She's a, she's a reporter. We've worked together for many years. Um, one day she gets a call from a student from an university in the U.S. And the guy says, look, I'm doing a story. I'm, I'm doing a... Uh, um, my thesis is about political coverage in South America. Can I interview you? And she's in a very naive... Uh, she said, yeah, sure. Uh, right? A student, yes. So... He interviews her on the coverage of Bolsonaro. And the Bolsonaro story, basically, she was responsible for covering the, uh, the alleged, I would say, misconduct of one of the sons of Bolsonaro in Rio. Uh, so she tells him in English. A couple of days later, a very dirty blog uh, publishes her interview to the student with fake subtitles. And the fake subtitles said, I'm here to destroy their family. And what she never said that such a thing. Uh, and who tweets that story? The president of the country. Can you imagine her life? I mean, if you, if you put on, the, if you listen to the audio, obviously she's not saying that, not by any means that, uh, that she's saying that. But the translation says, I'm here to destroy um, his family. And we are there to do whatever it takes to get there. The president retweets, tweets. The entire system, basically, his system, puts the story out as we have to go after her. And they went after her. That is the dramatic story. So, I mean, for many days, she disappeared. Uh, for many days, she wouldn't write. Still today, uh, we always talk to her. Um, it's something that will traumatize her work for many and many years. So the attack is uh, explicit. It's not hidden in a way. So that, you know, the Washington Post says that um, uh, democracies die in the dark. Uh, not, not in Brazil. Huh? In Brazil, it, it dies in daylight, absolutely daylight, in the tweets, in, in uh, attacks that we suffer absolutely every single day. Sorry for this. Thank you. Janina, what would you like to add on also on this, this question of how, what can we do? Yeah, what can we do? Well, uh, I think taking also the third question on the institutions, I think it's a very clear way, thinking in Latin America, not in the specific case of saving democracy in Brazil, which is much more complex, I think. Uh, the impeachment, they take something quite, simple with the institution, the institutional design, because the impeachment is, was not only a problem for Dilma, and it's on, not only a problem now. I mean, we have in the Latin American countries experienced many impeachments in the last 15, 20, 25 years, and many of these impeachments were really unfair. It takes Paraguay with Lugo in 2012. There are more cases, not only, not only that. So I think it's clear that the institution should be reformed. And first of all, it's a question of thinking if the impeachment as an institution should be uh, uh, regulated or not. And in case it is decided that it, uh, it, um, it has an important role, and think, I think clearly should be complemented with a popular vote. 
like an indirect recall. I mean, if the parliament decides to remove the president, immediately should be a vote of the people ratifying or not. And, and this would introduce direct legitimacy and avoid all this mess. So I think this is a very clear institutional way. And, and I think I have discussed this with Brazilian people many times. Also uh, with uh, Shambilis in, in Zurich two years ago, because I think it's a, it's a mistake to talk about this as a coup. And he says this has a political effect when we protest, and I understand that clearly. But I think it also hides that the process is legal. It's, it's really, I mean, unfortunate and, and it's awful if you want, but it's legal. The process was legal. And, and I think in this sense, we have to really think in changing the institution. Paulo. Hello, yeah. First, I will pick into the intercept that uh, I think the, the colleague was mentioned. I think it was politically a turning point. Now we, we're starting to know what really happened. But, but I am a lawyer, so from a legal point of view, I mean, we didn't need, you know, to, to see the intercept, you know, to conclude, for example, the criminal charge and the trial against Lula was a farce. You know, if you know a bit of, of a law, you know, you know that there was no real ground for him to be uh, charged and prosecuted like that. And then the courts of appeals uh, scheduling fast tracking uh, his case to adjust the electoral calendar. But that, that was really clear. And then once Lula was off the electoral process, and then, uh, so to say, they slow track the appeals proce procedures. And now, I mean, the authorities, they don't know what to do with Lula in prison. And then on the second point, you know, I just want to remind that we are on a on a presidential system. So an impeachment is not as easy as a motion of non-confidence that so many European uh, uh, democracies have it. So, I mean, to be impeached because of the body of the work, or what you say in Brazil, conjunto da obra, is really to threaten our institutions, you know? Like in, in, in France, in, in, in many nice countries, they have the lady democracy as a, a lady and so on. And the, and the one and the democracy in Brazil is a lady who is a poor black in and, and the favela and needs very much you know, support from our society. I, I think, I hope now that with the, uh, all the revelations that Intercept is, is uh, leaking or you know, publicizing uh, every week, the population well, uh, wakes up and, and see the, the, the reality. You know, this is, uh, having said that, uh, I have my criticism to, to, the, to the Labour's party and so many, and so many, including on human rights issue, but I think this is clear. And on my fellow uh, country woman on the question of institutions, I will slightly uh, disagree w with you, but on a note that uh, there's a stigma in Brazil that ah, we don't have institutions, yeah, you know, and so on. So our self esteem really is like, you know, we sort of shrink because I think we have a long way to go. I think there is a need for reform, you know, if you see the Latin American countries, but you have many things who work. And, who, and, and many things that are threatened. One of them is our pension system. So the main promise to Bolsonaro, of Bolsonaro to the financial market was to unearmark, you know, the, 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 our public budget, and through that, or, or doing that by the reform of our pension system. So this is one institution, probably we are rich enough not to depend depend on, rely on that, but millions of Brazilians, they rely on that. And the other one is our national health system. It's uh, similar to the, the uh, British NHS, you know? Uh, it doesn't deliver a Grey's Anatomy standard of health, you know? Yeah, don't expect that from a public hospital, but life expectancy in Brazil has increased a lot in the last four decades. It has much more, I also have much, much criticism of the SUS, but it's something you know, to put on, on the table, to criticize openly and to improve it. And 
not an excuse, you know, to, to dismantle the few institutions or the growing institutions that, that we have. Janina, you would like to add something? Yeah. yeah because was a question about the, the Workers' Party and Lula's responsibility, which I think is quite key also. Um, I, I think, as I said, that there is much more to analyze, to understand really why Bolsonaro's won. And of course, I think you suggested to somehow that the economical crisis was in there, criminality was growing much more after, but was growing from Dilma's times. And, and also, I think it's a quite interesting point is that Brazil was seen as a model of participatory democracy for many years and, and was quite well known for this participatory budgeting and conferences of public policies. And, and I think we have to reflect a lot on why, I mean, what happened with this because it's quite uh, hard to understand how this could be removed just in, in such a quickly movement. So something probably was not working as we thought or as was informed. So I think, yes, there is a responsibility. And in this sense, we can't criticize the documentary because clearly it's selecting some things to tell, but there is much more in the story. So I, I'm told we uh, have uh, the president of um, the Human Rights Commission of the Parliament. So I don't know um, uh, if, um, Heldra Solmao, would you like to make a statement or comment on what has been said. Any case, uh, in, in, during the debates, do not hesitate to, to raise your hand if you, okay, thank you. Boa noite. Quem é que vai traduzir? Hein? Good night. Uh, good evening. <risos> Bom, primeiro quero agradecer. Eu sou deputado federal, Elder Salomão, presidente da Comissão de Direitos Humanos e Minorias da Câmara dos Deputados no Brasil. Também está aqui conosco a Érica Cocai. Excuse me. Uh, excuse me. Just yeah. Uh, um, he, uh, I would like to thank, uh, um, I'm Elder Salomon, I'm the President of the Commission of Human Rights and Minorities of the National Congress of Brazil. Erika Cocai, deputada federal, é, também membro da Comissão de Direitos Humanos e da Frente Parlamentar em Defesa dos Direitos Humanos. Congresswoman Erika Cocai, also member of the Commission uh, and uh, Defense of... Uh, Yeah, human rights and minorities. É, nós estamos aqui numa missão representando a Câmara Federal e participamos de diversas reuniões com o alto comissariado e hoje na reunião do evento é, promovido pela sociedade civil sobre a revisão periódica universal. E nós trouxemos um relatório é, com as violações de direitos humanos no Brasil. Uh, we are here in the official uh, uh, mission by the Congress, uh, by the Federal Congress. Uh, we uh, had uh, uh, several meetings, uh, including uh, with, the high, with the Office of the High Commissioner, uh, but also a meeting where we uh, presented the conclusions of a report that we have produced. É, são 26 itens, é, e o mais importante é a gente compreender que hoje a retórica contra os direitos humanos do Brasil é feita pelas altas autoridades do nosso país, inclusive pelo presidente da República. There are 26 items and um, the most important thing is to realize that um, the rhetoric, the anti-human rights rhetoric uh, is led is done by uh, the officials basically uh, the president of the Republic of Brazil. É, o, este filme, o documentário da Petra, é um retrato fiel e muito, muito vigoroso do que aconteceu no Brasil nos últimos anos. E o governo de hoje representa o processo de um golpe que retirou do poder uma presidenta que não cometeu nenhum crime 
e, por isso, quem hoje governa, governa para desmontar, desconstruir tudo aquilo que foi feito nos últimos anos. So Petra's movie is a, a true image of what happened in Brazil, um, and what we live today uh, is the um, what is the conclusion or the uh, the consequence of the coup d'état that began uh, at that period. I know I missed a lot, but that's the. the <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being concise. Um, É, rapidamente, é, as revelações do The Intercept vão consolidando aquilo que nós denunciamos lá em 2015, que a Operação Lava Jato não se trata de uma operação de combate ao crime e à corrupção. Se trata de um movimento político liderado pelo ex-juiz Sérgio Moro e pelos procuradores, alguns procuradores do Ministério Público, é, e todas as informações reveladas, as principais, mostram que não há separação entre quem denuncia e apura as irregularidades e aqueles que julgam. Então, o acusador... E o julgador, o tempo todo, se misturam para, ao nosso ver, em forma de conluio, tirar a liberdade política do ex-presidente Lula. Nós concluímos que Lula é um preso político, sim. Sim, yeah, so in a nutshell, as uh, revelações uh, provided now by Intercept, they consolidate our understanding of what we have been telling Years ago, that the car wash, the Lava Jato operation by the federal police was not uh, uh, truly intended to combat corruption in Brazil, but it, it had a political uh, motive uh, and it mixed the, 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 uh, uh, the functions of prosecutor and judge uh, with, a, with, a, with a aiming at removing Lula from 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 power and uh, we, we we're here to say that Lula today is a political prisoner. Thank you, uh, thank, thank you very you. much, Mrs. Anwar. So um, <laughs> let's take another round of questions here in the middle, if there are any. So, ah, oh, excuse me, so, sorry. Yes. Nós ficamos, estamos muito felizes de estarmos participando desta discussão sobre o que acontece no Brasil, que não é apenas restrito ao Brasil. We are here, we are here happy to dialogue about something related to Brazil, but it's not restricted to the Brazilian context. Nós sofremos um, um golpe e nós estávamos no parlamento quando se impôs um impeachment sem crime de responsabilidade. We underwent a coup when we, we were in parliament in the absence of any crime of responsibility or impeachable crime. E uma ruptura democrática, ela não fica limitada. Ela vai invadindo o terreno dos direitos. Democracia e direitos elas não são solitárias, caminham juntos. O direito leva a democracia para todos os lugares do país, percorre e entra no Brasil profundo e invisibilizado. Sim, yeah, so, uh, in a nutshell again, uh, when when democracy is affected, it's not only democracy who, who, who suffers, but also rights, because democracy and rights they walk Hand in hand. E ao mesmo tempo, a democracia é fundamental para a existência dos direitos. E ao mesmo tempo, a democracia é fundamental, é essencial para o enjoyamento dos direitos. Nós temos uma presidência, na presidência da República, uma pessoa que assume, sem nenhum tipo de pudor, a sua misoginia a sua LGBTfobia 
e o seu desprezo e aversão aos direitos humanos. We have today the presidency office someone who is openly uh, misogynic, uh, LGBT phobic. Despreza os direitos humanos. Yeah, completely complete disregard to human rights. Todos os dias nós enfrentamos proposições de aumento do desarmamento, do armamento, de criminalização dos movimentos sociais e de naturalização do absurdo. On a daily basis, we, we receive threats, institutional threats of uh, increasing arms. Naturalização Naturalization of do violence absurdo. Or naturalization of the absurd. Por isso, nós estamos aqui para denunciar as violações de direitos no Brasil e para lutar pelo retorno da democracia. E, por isso, a gente diz Lula livre, fora fascismo do Brasil e de todos os países deste mundo. So, uh, uh, three quick questions. There is one here in the center. I see one here and one there. Yes, please. Oh, shall, I, shall I start? Okay. Um, I'm Felipe, I'm from Brazil also, and uh, thank you for the Institute for um, uh, showing this movie. I'm a student here, a first year student of development studies. And I, I would like to raise a question because I think there is a wave of, a conserva of conservative thinking um, associated also with fasc fascist ideas and very radical ideas also. And it started like Brexit and then election Trump in the US and Brazil's election also of Bolsonaro. And I think from what I, I've read, uh, that the... Excuse me, do you have a precise question? Yes, yes, yes. So, the thing is, uh, the, the role of social media and misinformation has helped all of this. So, what are you guys' views? Because you are a journalist and we all do with information and misinformation and the usage of misinformation to towards like this kind of mean goals and uh, in our society. and. Do you think, uh, in your international experience, that it's it's um, likely to happen in another country? Do you see that coming in anywhere else? Yeah, the question here. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, it's it's a straightforward question. And say, I'm I'm sorry if I missed something, and I may have missed something. Um, but this this uh, nice people who came to work they're working for a commission and they came to brazilian commission if i understood well and they came to the conclusion that the motive of the impeachment was based on political motives it was not based on any criminal or legal aspect let's say um in simple words <laughs> what is the consequence of this conclusion and and what will happen uh, following this? I mean, what is the mandate exactly or the power of this commission and, and, and their conclusion for the Brazil? Thank you. And then the question is this here. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Rafael, I'm working for International Human Rights NGO in Geneva. Um, I think as a Brazilian, it's very hard to see this movie because it just touches upon the very complex and hard feelings that we have as a Brazilian and we don't know how to explain it. And um, so I actually just want to ask the question that was asked at the end of the, of, the, of the documentary. How do we heal as a society? Because the problem is that, as you say, Jamil, the facts are here, we see them, they're exposed, but we have a sick society that just thinks that torture is okay. Um, I have a father that fought, on, fought uh, in student movements under the dictatorship and an aunt that thinks that torture is okay. And so how, like this, how do we, how, this is a question to you as experts, but also as Brazilians, how do we heal as a society? Thank you. Jamil. First, on, on the press and uh, the book, is this working? First, on the, the issue of, of information, the, the two elements that actually uh, at the end of the day are linked. Uh, first of all, and that's the, 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 
the, what we can say today is that the democratic systems were not ready, were not ready for uh, the, the digital, let's say, uh, unlimited, unregulated uh, way. So that's, that's for sure an, an element that has to be uh, said. I, uh, I have a, a father that says, did you see what Facebook said? So uh, it is true. Huh? Uh, we, uh, there was, there's an entire generation that was not ready, uh, and there's an entire political system that was not ready. So you have both things happening at the same time with a huge influence uh, in, in the path of your decision making, of your personal decision making. So this is one of the, uh, the elements. The second element uh, is the role of the press. Uh, and that's what I'm saying. Uh, since the, the other question was the same point, we didn't ask enough questions, we didn't uh, uh, go uh, deep enough, uh, and what they said, that um, nine families run uh, the entire media outlets in Brazil, it is true, uh, as it is true uh, even less uh, in the construction company, et cetera, et cetera. So, yes, uh, these things are real. Um, the element there, uh, and that is the, the, the challenge, uh, is to make uh, democracy work uh, with this new setting. Uh, this new setting is a very complicated one. You ask, if, is this going to continue somewhere else? Or not? Uh, the next is the Pope and the conclave. Trust me. Okay? So it, it is not only the election of... Um, of where we all vote, but it's all, every single decision that at one point will have to be taken based on sentiment, on the, the environment uh, where these elements are being uh, presented. So uh, are we gonna be able to regulate all of this? I have no idea, and is regulation the, the right answer? I have no idea either. Uh, so it is a huge, huge, huge challenge. In the beginning I thought, when all of this began, I said, no, but people will realize that this is not true. Mm. Anyway. Janina. Yeah, just to try to bring something positive, I think there are some innovations at hand. I don't say this is an automatic solution and will work, but I think it's time to think on that. Here at the University of Geneva, well, in Geneva, um, there is a project to include um, sorted assemblies to create public opinion before the citizens' initiative, which are submitted to vote, following the model of the CIR in Oregon or the model of Ireland. So I think we have to push for that, for a new ways of organizing campaigns, for a new ways of, I don't say it's automatic, I don't say it's easy, but we have some solutions at hand at least to push on that. Paolo. Yeah, three very small things, three little drops here. I think Filippi, uh, I like to play a lot with this trend, the words and so on, like fake news, misinformation. Is it, is it really new? No, yeah, for example, uh, in the 80s in Brazil, when there was a huge manifestation in downtown Sao Paulo, you know, fighting for just direta já to, you know, we want to vote for president regardless of the country, the big, big news, the corporate media, uh, announced it as the commemoration of the anniversary of the, of the city of Sao Paulo. You know, so is it a really, really new phenomenon or is it a, a new phase of a learning process of a society as, as, as a whole, you know? I, I'm learning very much with indigenous people. So, sometimes I go in this timeless thing. That, is it really new or a new name for an old thing? I think Brazil, yeah, Brazil has strong... Uh, tasks not to deal with the past, present, and future. So many things we haven't done since uh, centuries. I'm sorry to bring back the, this large past, but that's what is, it's, it's in my heart now, you know. I think uh, the colleague spoke about um, what are the consequences, it was legal or not. I think that Beyond any political party, we have uh, lady democracy, which is say in, in Brazil is, you know, I sort of depict her. And breaking the rules of the game. So if it's so easy to impeach a president who happened to be from the left government, 
what will be the uh, political stability the system will provide in 10, 20, 50 years? You know, be it a president of the right, of the wrong. You know, I have my political, uh, I have my political inclinations, but overall, you have to respect democracy. You know, so I sincerely also. I, I don't hope that uh, Bolsonaro will be impeachment without a reason, because worse than that, we're gonna have you know another overstretching of democracy. Yes, uh, on the healing process, I think this is the first phase of mourning. Brazil is in a deep mourning. You know the ones who supported, and I extend my solidarity for those who voted also. So in Bolsonaro, you know we're not a different country. We have to dialogue. Not the haters. No, the haters. You know it's another story. But there are many people who are really disappointed in Brazil, who expected, many of my family members voted for Bolsonaro, they expected more jobs, more this and then, and so far hasn't been delivered. I, I hope the best for my country, but I think we are such in a mourning process, which is the first part of, of a healing. I know there are more questions, but it's time to wrap up, so uh, I think the speakers will still be able to stay for a few minutes, uh, if, um, if it's possible. So um, thank you very much to the panelists and to the audience for being here. I think we had a really important and, um, and thought-provoking discussion upon the, the film, not only on Brazil, but also on, on, on democracy and democrat or disengagement and re-engagement with democracy uh, in Brazil and worldwide. So um, I invite you to continue the, the reflection and also to um, the next um, events and film screenings uh, organized here at the Grad Institute. There are some flyers outside. There are also flyers on events organized by the Albert Tishman Center on Democracy. So we look forward to seeing you at one of our events. And meanwhile, have a very good evening and thank you for your presence today.